Okay, welcome everyone to the October 19th, 2021 Open Planetary Lunch Talk. I have some coffee. I already ate lunch because it's two in the afternoon here. I don't know now, two years later, why I called it the lunch talk at all in the first place. Um, our speaker today is Kate Crombie from Indigo Information Services, a, an, a scientist and archivist, uh, very much after my own heart. We share many, uh, many philosophies and, and, uh, and bugbears about the archiving and software systems and planetary science. So this is sort of an accidental follow-on to my, my talk a few weeks ago. Uh, and this will be on uh, data archiving from a, a project management perspective. Really looking forward to it. Thank you, Kate, for being here. And when you're ready, just uh, take over screen share. Great, thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna share my screen here and I worked on it before, so let's hope it all works properly when I try and do it. Okay, can you all see my screen? Excellent. Okay, um, as Chase said, I'm Kate Crombie. I am an archive scientist. I have a background in earth and planetary sciences. I was a, a PhD student with Ray Arvidsson at Washington University in St. Louis. So I was introduced to the PDS uh, very early on in my uh, academic career, although I wasn't actually working in the PDS uh, as a grad student. I was working on uh, some earth science projects, but the PDS and data archiving things were happening all around me. So that's uh, my longtime background uh, with, with data archiving. Um, I work primarily as an archive scientist now uh, with um, NASA planetary missions. Um, I'm the archive scientist for the OSIRIS-REx mission. Um, I'm also working on the Lucy mission. Um, and recently I have taken a contract with the cartography and imaging node of the PDS to help out with some Mars 2020 work that they have going on. And, and what I'll be doing for them is mission interface work. So basically um, being the person standing between kind of the archive and uh, the mission and helping translate between the two and making sure that, that everybody's getting along and that the data is being passed appropriately. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to take a sort of broader view of, of your archive development. And I'm, I tried to make this presentation um, more generic than, than uh, a NASA uh, ROSES proposal uh, type, type talk. I, I wanna include um, everyone here. And I think you can all use this um, broader approach and a more systems approach for any project that you're gonna do uh, to get to an end product where you're delivering data to an archive. Okay, let me see. So the first step is sort of this archive systems planning if we take a broad view. Um, so data return from all the NASA planetary missions. Um, this, this I think is something that Chase and I have much in common is that the data that comes back and the software that is used to produce these, these data products is the scientific legacy of these endeavors. And so it's, it, it is something that, that needs to be out in, in the public domain within the scientific community for all of us to use uh, to create more science from. So NASA requires that all missions archive raw and calibrated uh, scientific instrument data. Uh, it encourages, and it is more and more strongly encouraging um, uh, the production and archival of derived data products. Um, and, and missions have used many methods to fulfill this requirement. Um, I have been doing this work for about, um, well, in my own company for about 14 years. And then I was working uh, on the Mars Odyssey project from about 2001. So about 20 years I've been, I've been uh, producing uh, data products and delivering them to PDS archives. And over that course of time, I've seen you know, many, many methods used to fulfill the archive requirements from um, don't think about it till the very last moment to a full sort of systems engineering approach that goes uh, over the entire mission life, side, life cycle. So what I think is, is the better, more appropriate way to do things is to use a systems engineering approach um, that that really looks at the archive as an integral part of the complete missions system. And so for an individual grant, you could look at it in the same way where you know that you are going to be required 
to archive some, some data products. So if you understand that at the beginning, uh, you can make a full mission or a full project plan that will incorporate that work uh, into the basic basic work of what you're going to do. So let's go to the next slide. Oops, sorry, this is not working exactly like I thought it was. Okay, so when you want to uh, propose a project to some, some grant requests, um, the first thing that I'd ask you to do is, is think like a systems engineer. And to think like a systems engineer, you'll need to think about your proposed project from uh, the point of view of several different, different disciplines and from the complete life cycle of your project, from your proposal uh, all the way through your, your closeout, which, which may be delivery of data products to an archive. It may be um, the publication of, of scientific papers that may also include the archival of some data products. So, so think from the beginning to the end, but don't just think about it as I am a particular type of scientist answering a particular type of question. You kind of got to step back a little bit and think about what are all the pieces that I'm going to need for this project. So, so there, there may very well be parts of the project where you need to think um, specifically like an altimetrist or a sample scientist who looks at electron micropope data. But you're also going to need to think um, in other ways. Uh, you may need to think a little bit about the, the business aspects of this proposal. You know, what is your budget going to be? How many people do you need to work on the project? Um, for the purposes of my talk, I want you to think like an archive scientist. And so what does an archive scientist do? So in the context of a large mission proposal, the archive scientist acts as the interface between the project, the business kind of folks to keep schedule and budget, et cetera, the instrument teams, which are the folks that, that build the instruments that are going to make the measurements, uh, the ground data systems folks, uh, who are the folks who are going to process all of the data that comes back from the instruments um, in particular ways that's that's probably dictated by what the instrument teams are, are, are telling the ground data system. And then the PDS, the planetary data system, which for NASA missions would be the archive where, where the data is going to be uh, deposited um, sometime after collection uh, and kept around for 50 to 100 years for uh, scientists. Um, the scientist that I'm always thinking of is the grad student of the future who, um, has made some discovery and they know that it's something new and it's a little piece of information that then they say, aha, I think we may have seen this phenomenon before. And then they could go back and look at previous missions and say, look, we saw this thing and we now have a 50 year record of whatever this thing is. And it's only because all the missions before me, the projects before me deposited the data into, the, into an archive that I can go back and find. And now I can use to, to do something new. So that's, that's the person that, as an archive scientist, I'm I'm trying to um, I'm trying to to provide service for. So the archive scientist also um, informs and enforces uh, nationwide metadata standards or spatial data infrastructures. Um, basically, an archive scientist is wrangling all the different groups of people to try and make them understand that whatever the final data products are, they have to be understandable by all of those groups. Um, and having someone do this um, reduces uh, risks because they're looking from the beginning to the end of the mission and they're making the plan of how all these groups are gonna talk to each other. So, so a, an archive scientist can, can really also be a systems engineer because they're looking over all of these different groups of people and they're trying to create a, a final product that meets the needs of all of these, these groups. So, for an individual grant proposal, um, when you're thinking like an archive scientist, it means that you're going to be answering the following questions. And these are questions that you'll be asking about uh, the topic of, of your project is, you know, what are you going to, to, to archive? What needs to be archived? You'll look at your proposal call and it will give you some guidelines as to what specifically you'll need, need to archive. You're going to want to think about who's going to prepare the archive. 
where, which archive is, is this data going to? And in this talk, I'm using the term archive to include repositories. I'm not gonna make a distinction between archives and repositories. There is um, quite a bit of discussion between the two, but when I say an archive, I mean um, a system that's going to be around for uh, some long time in the future. Uh, it is something that is open, as open as it can be so that um, scientists and public can, can have access to the data, the data within this archive slash repository um, to the best of its ability follows uh, fair practices. So, so when I say archive in this uh, presentation, I'm not using uh, strict definitions of archives versus repositories. I, I'm kind of lumping, lumping them all together. Um, when do you need to get, get your data products into the archive? Uh, and then also how will the archive be prepared? So these are the kinds of questions that you're gonna to need to answer. And the good news is that when you kind of finish answering all these questions, you'll be really well prepared to write your data management plan that, that at least for NASA proposals, they are all requiring the data management plan. So, so let's, let's take a look at, at a project like a systems engineer. Sorry. Okay, so to use the systems engineering, uh, systems engineering process for your proposal, I'd like to talk about something called data product traceability. And this is something that is uh, derived from uh, a portion of, of science mission proposals called the science traceability matrix. Um, it's a really kind of cool table that all of these big mission proposals put together. Uh, it contains the science goals and objectives, you know, what measurements are needed to fulfill those science objectives, what kind of instruments you would need to make those measurements, what those instrument observation requirements would be to, to make the measurements that are needed. So these first five uh, columns here are sort of the columns that would be in a traditional uh, mission science traceability matrix. And if you're kind of interested in, in knowing more about that, I've put a link to a really, really good um, uh, slideshow that was given at a NASA Launchpad seminar. So if you're interested, take a look at, at that, uh, that link there and you'll you'll learn more than you ever could want to know about mission science traceability matrices, but it's really kind of an interesting approach to, to thinking through a, a, a project. So the piece that, that um, I've added in, in projects I've worked on is adding these last two columns. So when you've made your observation requirements, you know what instrument you're going to use to make some kind of observation. Uh, to answer your, your science objective, your, your big question. Generally, you are going to need a data product. You're going to need to produce a data product to answer that question. And generally, this is not all the time, but generally the data product that's going to answer that question is going to be a derived data product. And by that, I mean, it's a data product uh, that is produced to address the particular hypothesis that, that you've posed, but it is made up of, of many other data products. So it's a second, so it's a second tier data product. It's a higher level data product where you're putting some lower level data products, synthesizing those together to, to answer this question. If you know what this derived data product needs to be, then you can think through the process of how am I gonna come up with this derived data product? What do I need to do? What measurements do I need to make? What data do I need to acquire to put this product together? And that would be these lower level data products. So these would be products that, that only address, partially address the, the, the hypothesis. So in a systems engineering term, we would have um, this level two requirement meeting data product, but the the lower level products that go into making that would be a level three requirement data product. You don't really need to know about levels of requirements, but the lower level to, to higher level data product is something that you should probably start thinking about. So let me give you an example of what I mean here. So you have 
a level two science requirement, that's that science goal. And for this example, I'm using um, an example from altimetry. Um, and this is one that I kind of pulled and modified from an OSIRIS-REx level two science requirement. So for a three sigma error ellipse around a candidate site, it could be a landing site, it could be a data collection site, whatever, produce a topographic map at a spatial and vertical resolution of less than 50 centimeters. Okay, that's fine. So what do we really need to produce as the derived data product? We're gonna um, produce a, a local digital terrain model. Well, in order to produce this local digital terrain model, what kinds of things might we need? We might need some raw altimeter data, we might need the reduced altimeter data. And by reduced, this is um, where the digital numbers have been converted to physical units, but maybe they're not, uh, they don't have proper timing added. Uh, they need some time calibration. So there could be uh, calibrated altimeter data, data that, that makes some other kinds of corrections, maybe take some noise out of the system. Um, to come up with the kind of best data to put into this, this level two product. We might need the mass of the object if it's an asteroid, we might need the gravity of the object, and we might need some spice kernels. So these would be the lower level products that would go into this, this derived product. So you've kind of now thought about your project in this way, and you know what the kind of base data products are that you need to, to make your, your hypothesis testing uh, data product. What you're gonna need to do then is you're gonna need to identify who will produce these lower level data products or figure out where they'll be acquired from. So in this particular example, the data products that are in white, we're just gonna imagine are data products that we are going to um, acquire from somewhere else. So let's say we can go back to the PDS uh, or the PSA and we can pull the raw altimeter data. We can pull the reduced altimeter data and we decide that, that these would be okay for our process, for our purposes, but we know we're gonna need to do another calibration for some reason or another to, to meet our, our spatial requirement. We know also that we can, you know, pull the, the uh, asteroids mass, the asteroids gravity from some other sources, but we know that we're going to need to create new spice kernels um, as we, we put our, our um, terrain model together. So in, in this example, the red items are, are the new data products. So then the other thing we need to do is, is after we decided, we know which ones we're going to have to produce ourselves. We know where we're going to get the ones that, that we need to go into the ones we're going to produce our, ourselves. We're going to need to identify the processing environment that we're going to use to produce each of these products. And when I say the processing environment, it's do we have software that does this? Do we need to write software that does this? Uh, do we um, you know, need to hire a consultant to write this 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 software for us, how, how are we actually going to um, do the production of, of each of these, these? As we're doing this, we're probably going to need to identify um, what are the, the input data formats from, from all of these? What is the output data format of all of these? Um, and, and what is our data volume? Because that's going to determine, can you use your laptop? Do you need to go to a, get a cluster to help you do the, the processing? So um, when you're at this stage of the game, you're, you're gonna be trying to answer a lot of, of these questions about um, who and where and how uh, you're going to get all of these items to, to make your, your final product. Um, I have a caution here, and it's it's about the uh, software that you may create to 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 make your data products. Um, many of you who are uh, working closely with NASA, you may be aware that um, 
there's been a new policy put out by the Science Mission Directorate called SPD 41. It is the data management policy uh, of the Science Mission Directorate. It was just released in August of this year. And within that policy document, um, there is some direction that NASA will soon require software to be archived for Science Mission Directorate funded projects. Um, I don't know all the details of this. Um, there is more information that is expected from the agency soon about this. But if you are going forward and you're thinking about putting in a proposal to NASA in the next few years, uh, keep your, your eyes and ears open because new things will be happening with the software, with software archiving. Okay, so you know what your data products are generally going to be, you've kind of, you know about what data volume you have, you probably have identified kind of what your input formats and output formats are going to be. So you have some, some idea of, of what the data products you are going to have. Now you need to identify your archives. Where are you going to archive your data products or your software? And it may be in the future that it will be archives, plural, because you may have different archives for your data products or your software. Again, I don't know how that's all gonna go. That's, that's TBD. Um, so um, as my caution is here, uh, requirements uh, for archiving are changing and, and being more fully enforced. So be certain that your archive choice, whatever it may be, is compatible with whatever proposal guidelines you have. And this, this goes for everyone, whether you're a NASA, a, a NASA type um, proposal or some other type proposal, just make sure that your choice is compatible with the guidelines. So where should you archive your data? There are many choices. Um, there are PDS and IPDA type data archives. So these would be um, PDS, uh, PSA, um, DARTs for the, the Japanese uh, repository, um, any of the repositories that use the PDS4 standard are the, the archives that I'm talking about in this first bullet. Um, there are high submission requirements for, for these type of archives. Uh, there are another set of, of archives that would be the type of archives that people uh, are putting, um, if you're doing a publication and you need to put your table and figures type data products into a repository, these are the types of repositories people are using. Um, there is uh, data.nasa.gov, uh, which is um, basically the NASA GitHub. So this might be somewhere that you would go with software. Again, I know the software front is developing. It is also not my area of expertise. So if there are questions about that, we may have to defer them to um, other folks in the room here. Um, and then if you don't know where your data belongs, uh, you could you could look for a research data repository that would be listed in this registry of, of research data repositories. But if you don't really know, my suggestion would be to take a look at um, data that you might be acquiring. So in, in my example on the previous slide, it would be the data from um, the raw altimetry data. Look for where that data was archived and that might be an appropriate place to put your um, derived products, um, your, your new calibrated products, whatever it is you might have. Um, again, if you don't know, um, the PDS folks are, are really helpful and they will take your questions and they will be happy to say, yes, we are happy to take that or no, that's not appropriate for us, but here might be a better, better place. So, um, You could, you could go that route too. The really important part here is understand that different archives have different submission requirements that will significantly impact the time and cost of data preparation. So from my perspective, um, putting data into a planetary data system type archive which requires you to write uh, metadata labels as well as, as properly formatting 
uh, your data products, that requires a significant amount of effort. Um, if you are putting your data into a repository that requires uh, your data to have sort of your published paper um, method section attached to a spreadsheet, that has a different, you know, a different submission requirement, and it, it may take you less time and and less cost to prepare that data. So, so really, as you're thinking through this process, understand that you will have different times and costs depending on the archive that you choose. So, part of this. Um, archive product definition would be done in the proposal portion and part of it would be done done after once you are selected. So identifying archive requirements, the submission requirements that I was just talking about, that is something that you would do at the proposal stage. You wouldn't quite get to initial archive product definition in the proposal stage, but this would be something that you should do fairly early on in your life cycle of your development to understand what it is you're trying to produce um, during your project. So for the proposal stage, at least, you want to identify your archive submission requirements and understand the delta between your, your known products. So if you kind of know what the formats are of the data products that you're using, if you know what those are and you know what the submission requirements are, you know how different those are. If your data products are pretty close to the submission requirements, then you might need less effort to develop your final, final archive products. Um, if they are very far apart, that is going to take significantly more effort, and so that will need to be uh, accounted for in your plan. Um, I've been through this identifying your formats. Um, once you are selected, so I'm kind of jumping ahead here because you will get selected because you've done all of this work, um, you will want to develop prototype data products and you will want to get an initial review by whichever archive uh, or repository that you are putting your data into very early in, in your project plan. The reason you want to do that is you want to make sure that your plan that you have have developed is reasonable and you want to make sure that you are developing to that final product rather than having to change things wholesale right at the end. You don't want to do that. It, that, that makes for um, an unhappy proposer and an unhappy archivist because it's just very difficult if you've gone through a whole project and developed to a particular um, format or standard and then to have to wholesale change it right at the end. You, know, you certainly can't say that, okay, we'll do that in two weeks and then call our archive process good. That, that's not what you want to do. You want to integrate that, that um, process of how you take your, um, your production data products and turn them into archival data products. And you wanna pull that into this sort of main, main path of your, your development effort. Um, if you know that you have a large delta between the current uh, data formats that you have and your archival data uh, products that you will have, you really want to ask yourself how long the process will take to go from one to the other. And you want to develop a realistic schedule that includes iteration with the archive. Um, this, this is kind of a big deal um, and, and how to develop that realistic schedule. Um, I'm not going to go into at, on this talk, but Chase did an awesome job at the last talk talking about um, developing budgets and schedules uh, and estimates for projects. So, so take a look at, at his his talk if you can, because that was a a really good a really good tutorial on how to develop this realistic schedule. Um, another caution here: uh, data release policies are maybe not necessarily changing, but I think enforcement is is uh, definitely uh, getting stronger. Uh, that SPD forty one that I talked about earlier. It has really strongly worded language about uh, six months after data collection. 
um, I'm not sure again how that's all going to really roll out in the next few years with with um, NASA proposals. But but again, be sure to read your 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 proposal guidelines carefully so that you are you are within whatever the data release policy is when you're developing your schedule. Okay, now we're to step five, which is the data management plan. So if you've done all of the work that we talked about in the previous steps, um, putting the data management plan together for your proposal should be fairly straightforward because you should have all the information uh, needed to, to write that data management plan. So you'll know what data has planned to be produced and, and which hypothesis um, that data product will address. Um, you will have an idea of the formats and data volume of your produced products. Uh, you'll know which archive you're planning to submit data to, and you'll know the format and submission requirements for that archive. Um, you know, as you're researching those archives, you'll, um, you should know the long-term viability of the archive and its public release mechanisms. So that should be easy to incorporate into your data management plan. Um, you will know who on your team and your team may just be yourself. Uh, it could be a bunch of people who is responsible for producing which data product. Um, and you'll have an idea of the schedule for your data product production. And you should uh, have some idea of the work plan involved in getting the data products ready for data submission. Um, so, you know, you will you will have worked through each one of these points. Um, here, I've just uh, linked to the NASA's NASA Roses Data Management Plan template. Uh, if anybody's interested, I'm sure if you've submitted to that that program those programs before, you will be very familiar with this. But here's just. Uh, Here's the link for anyone who's interested. And then because you did all this work, you, your project will have been selected uh, and then you can move on to step six, which is archive imp implementation. So again, prototype product development early and having initial review by uh, your archive will really save you a lot of time and effort uh, down the road because you can fix things up uh, early in your development process instead of having to wait right to the end and making wholesale changes right at the end. Nobody wants to do that. If you can have this initial product review and, and your prototypes uh, in really good shape before you do your nominal data collection, that would be that that would put you in really good shape so that once you've collected your data, you can start your archive preparation. Uh, you can deliver to your archive and your archive is probably gonna do a review. And if you've been really clever in your previous lean resolution, you should be pretty good here and not have too much work to do. Um, in my experience at this point, if you've gone through all the previous uh, steps to do early review of your data products, um, Generally, this last step, it's usually the documentation and not the actual uh, data products that, that need some help at this point. So not that that's uh, really simple to fix, but it is certainly much less burdensome to fix documentation at this point than it is to go back and have to recreate a full data product. And then finally, once, once your archive is happy with your your delivery and you, you've met all of the re review requirements, the archive will be made, made public. So, you know, the, the key to this archive implementation, implementation step is to start early, use the plan that you developed in your proposal and talk with your archive representatives so that you can make sure that you are developing uh, a product and a product set that is that is in line with their expectations, so that you don't have to change course late in your late in your game plan. So that is is the kind of process that that I think a, a proposer should go through, and then once they've gotten the, the the grant to implement their archives, that I think you should go through to get your products to an archive. 
my last slide are uh, just some resources that, that you might find helpful um, in either writing data management plans or learning about um, the PDS archiving uh, practices and policies, um, and then some of, of NASA's policies on, on data management and uh, how things are, are moving forward. So this first link is to that SPD 41 uh, policy document that, that I think anyone in our, our business will be um, getting used to in the next few years and, and changes will be made. I know that there will be an RFI period for this policy coming up. Uh, you will get a notice uh, through Inspires if you are subscribed to that. Um, and I would encourage everyone on this call who is interested in, in that kind of data policy to take the uh, RFI uh, submission time to, to let uh, the headquarters folks know, know how implementation of, of this policy will affect will affect us. I would be more than happy to take questions. Anybody? Thank you. I think, sorry, I think I lost audio for the very end of your talk. Oh. I see, um, do you have a question? Can't sorry, I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to confirm that, that the audio was lost at the very end there. Oh dear. Oh, was it lost for everyone? I thought it was just me. I didn't hear it, no. Oh, okay. Um, it was just the, the last few seconds after you, okay. Okay, I think the very um, last thing I said, I was encouraging folks to um, take part in the RFI process on this SPD 41 when it comes out. 